have the truck now, I know. My wife hates it. I have a minivan. <sighs> you know, lift it. I look bald in this hat. This is service. What do you want? I just want it off my neck. What? It's almost Christmas. I can't be looking like a bum. I can give you artistic license. How's it feel? I feel better. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of evened it out. Welcome to the ADH Dan podcast. Thank you for having me. You have to say the line. I forget it already. I know I've watched it. What it is it? It goes where it goes. It goes where it goes. That's right. I remember that. I'll try it again. Yeah. Welcome to the ADH Dan podcast. It goes where it goes. That was kind of anticlimactic. Yeah. Well, it's a thin can. Yeah. I had a girlfriend like that once. A thin can? Anticlimactic. Oh. First order of business. Yeah. I love the wrapping on this. Yeah. I took a lot of time. <laughs> Wanna do it right? See? I'll remember Jordan's name. Oh, sweet. But if anyone would forget Jordan's name, I made him this name plaque, which you can either place in the trash or you can hang it on your wall. I put no, a little... No, I love the Strat uh, backplate on here. I have another surprise, and I feel like this needs to start kind of at the beginning. Because okay. I'm excited, very excited for this. My mother-in-law just gave these to me yesterday, I believe. Okay. Have you had these? What is this? Liquor-filled chocolates. Oh, gosh, no. Yeah. This is so. an <laughs> advent calendar of liquor-filled chocolates. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Without sugar crust. Right, which I don't understand. Yeah, but I, that means. I did had three of them. And then I thought, I need to stop so we can save some. So, okay, get caught up here. Maybe we'll even time travel a little bit. You want to try that? I'm going to try this. Label 5 Scotch Whiskey. Wait, what are you pulling? You want to trade? It's like Pokemon? Camus. What is that? I don't know. How bad did this taste because i'm actually not... i think they're really good oh okay really i okay. love them okay okay did you just pop the whole thing mm -hmm. oh god wow a little asmr <laughs> no it's very wet mm-hmm I don't know why I didn't think it would be this wet. Mm -hmm. It's strange. It doesn't taste bad. Hmm. No. It's an experience. They are premium liquors. What What there's did it say? There's a lot in that one. So this is St. James. This is rum. So how old were you when oh I first went to Faith? The church that we used to go to? Yeah, the, uh, um, I remember going there since I was like, because we used to go to like Church of God over in Claysburg, and I did like Royal Rangers, and then I went over to Faith and did Royal Ranger stuff there. So I had to have been like ten, at the youngest. But when when you were there, yeah, I was gonna say you. There's no way you were ten. I mean, that's when I started. Yeah, um, I'm not that old. No. Um, what was that, 2004? Do you remember the year? Yeah, it would have been 2004 because I think Meredith was a newborn. Mm hmm So 14. it would have been... Yeah. Now she's three years older than you were then. This one's tough. Was it the one that was cracked? Yeah. <laughs> it probably fermented a little more. Definitely rum. <laughs> when did you... Start playing guitar or take an interest in music. I remember it was like a summer, I want to say summer before seventh grade, I want to say. So I was like 12, 13. And I, uh, I remember just like, I was in band, I was playing trumpet and I was pretty good. They were like sending me to like, you know, other stuff. 
like district bands and county bands and like doing stuff like that. But I wanted to do something cool and that was with Claysburg, Northern Bedford's where I went in school. Okay, and uh, I wanted to do something cooler than trumpet because I was like trumpet is I couldn't do I felt like I couldn't do anything else with it other than school band. I mean, being young. And so I just remember asking my mom, I saw like a guitar at a store. It was like a first act. And I was just like, I will mow the lawn all summer long if you get this thing for me. It's hundred bucks. We'll get it for me. And she did. I don't think I ever mowed a lawn that summer and just played guitar. And yeah, we just, me and uh, Matt, who's in my band, and he also works with me. He was my apprentice and now works full time at the shop. We started the same year. So we've both been playing for 19 years. Oh, wait, that wasn't the same band though, right? back then no my band now but like yeah. he works with me but we were just talking about this at the barbershop the other day okay so you guys so have we been know playing it's 19 years no amount just, of time yeah exact same amount of time yeah so i'll be getting 20 years next year i think mm-hmm. so that's pretty crazy to think about yeah it's a lot of hours you just get old i, I think yeah. the older i get i realize that's how time works i mean when did you start playing guitar um 98 how old were you I was in eighth grade. Eighth grade, okay. Yeah. So similar. Fourteen. Like, yeah. 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 So, what kind of sparked your interest? Like you said, you wanted to play something cooler. But yeah, I, don't, I think it was like for some reason. I want to say the first thing that comes to mind is just thinking of like Green Day, and like uh, I feel like American Idiot was like big, and like that was like something I was like really wanted to do, and uh, <laughs> Skillet <laughs> of all things, like. Mm-hmm alien youth was a thing and i was like this is awesome just that sound like i feel like if you like guitar the first time you hear an electric guitar overdriven of any kind you're like i want to know what that is i want to know more of that Mm -hmm. because even like as a kid listening to 50s music i gravitated to like chuck berry who was yeah who defined every form of rock and roll since and uh yeah just something about that sound i just i wanted to be able to do that Mm -hmm. in my ocd nature made it so that once i started it wasn't stopping ever mm-hmm. <laughs> which is my wife which is sometimes it wouldn't but right i i just fell in love with it it's really what it came down to yeah and told my band director to screw off basically one time because i just didn't want to do it anymore and he wanted me to and i was like no and just play guitar ever since did you take any lessons um i was taking drum lessons with jeremiah first and it just it was okay and it wasn't you know it wasn't quite gravitating towards it like i thought it would um but for a guitar i no just started pulling up tabs of stuff i wanted to learn and just like kind of teaching myself that way i had a book that i didn't really follow i just kind of wanted to learn and having an ear for sheet music and music already i was able to kind of figure stuff out that way but in college i took lessons with a buddy for like a little bit um it was like a extracurricular like class that i was taking but he was like a friend of mine so it was like he worked for the school but was my buddy and so now he like towards full time with like andy mckee and he's on candy rat records is insane trevor gordon hall he's awesome and uh yeah we just kind of did stuff that way but that was only the ever formal quote-unquote lesson i ever took it was all self-taught so wait can you read music Mm -hmm. oh wow yeah, I can I, read music, but like as far as what any of the bands I play with currently or like places I fill in at, you don't have to. Yeah. I literally just pull the songs up that we're playing, learn them, then right. I tweak them the way that I want to, and then go out. I just hate I hate copycatting things. Yeah. So yeah. I almost always tweak whatever we're doing to like fit what I think maybe more my style or fit the music better or mm-hmm. just have fun with it. I don't think people have enough fun with it sometimes. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just like messing with it. So I, I can, but just everything with life, people don't have enough fun. That's very true. But uh, <laughs> theory is like the biggest thing. Once I made myself learn even rudimentary theory, that helped immensely in figuring out what to do and when. Mm-hmm. And so once you have that basic understanding, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Your first band then was that um, covers did you try to write things we had like a middle school band that was just like doing like covers i remember learning like swing swing by the all-american rejects and like american idiot and like some other songs just for fun but my big goal was i wanted to play with you guys at faith i wanted like, weren't you playing there already no not at the beginning 
Not at all. Not when I was like young. Not oh, when I was like right. twelve. Who, it was like Nick and Nate. Nick and Nate Snyder, right? The brothers, the 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 model, beautiful brothers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Jeremy played guitar. Uh, Aaron played drums. Oh yeah. Jeremiah fronted. And then Steve Stell was playing. Oh Steve, yeah, played bass with yeah, yeah, that's Super Steve. When yeah. I came in, because I guess he went to school or something. He did, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that. Honestly, it would make me feel awkward when he came back because I felt like... You were filling in. Yeah, I feel like... No, I... Because he would come back and go to the whole youth group and not play. Yeah. And I felt like, dude, this you can play if you want. I yeah. just felt like I came in and just took over. Well, they I need... Know. I feel like bases where we always, like, were lacking. But it was crazy because Jeremy, Aaron, and... Steve are all related, right? Oh so yeah. Aaron and yeah, Steve are brothers. Out there, is Jeremy's their cousin, and then Nick and Nate were brothers. Yeah, and so it was like a family band with Jeremiah yeah, fronting. Much. And so as soon as all that started to change, it was like very interesting to see who would fill in because then eventually Jeremiah just went to the main building, and then like right. we started taking over right. and like doing stuff, which was amazing and tra- torturous at the same time yeah yeah that was because that was like when matt came in that i think that was a hard time for everyone to i i just felt like that was a big growing point for everyone in different ways oh yeah absolutely because like jeremiah was the youth pastor forever and then yeah. moved on to the main building was like doing all the stuff there and then we got a, the first time ever we had like a new pastor on staff mm-hmm. and it was Matt and Melissa and that just went insanely poorly. And I think they would even admit how poorly it went. Not even yeah. just because of them, but just the whole thing in general. Right. That was right. rough. That was super rough. But it was cool because like we had that group for a little bit. I don't know. It was like uh, Andy Mathias. Yeah. Matt Stell. Um, who do we have playing drums? We had somebody decent. I can't remember. Seth. Or... It was no, it still Seth Aaron? Didn't. No, Seth played keys. Yeah, played guitar and screamed. It was awesome. As soon as I said Seth, I thought I pictured the guitar. Yeah, and he screamed, and like I sang and played guitar, and it was, mm. it was great. It was so much fun. Do you know why I left there? No, I don't. Are you bitter that I left? <laughs> I guess that sounds I'm like not a... bitter. I'm not bitter. You left. I thought. And this just is funny because of our age gap. So at the time, right? Like I'm like yeah. 14, 15, 16. Impressionable. Very impressionable. And I just thought you were cool shit. I thought you were awesome. I thought you and your wife were super cool. And then you left and I was like, this sucks. <laughs> like, this is a bummer. But I don't know. And I'm sure there's a valid reason because there's so much under the nonsense that went on. Uh, yeah. There's so much nonsense um, in church that goes on in general. Yes. A men and a women. <laughs> so it... Somebody saw Derek Weaver out somewhere. A member of the church saw Derek Weaver somewhere, and he was drinking alcohol. Yeah. So they went to Pastor Baker. Daddy Baker. Yeah. Okay. And said, hey, we saw this. That's not a good example for the church. Yeah. First of all, he's not a member. He's not a member. He's not on staff. Saying, well, who gives a shit? So It was an AG stance that so they backtracked said, on. So he said, if you... To be in the praise band, I don't want you anyone drinking alcohol. And I was like, mm, okay, I can do that. It's like, that's fine. I've never been a big drinker. Yeah. So then I kind of felt convicted because I, at the time, I was smoking a lot of cigars. I, w- I never yeah. feel that I was addicted to cigars, but no. I just enjoy a it's good a cigar. It's a meditating thing. Yeah. That's what I like try to tell people. Like a cigar is like a... A reflection tool and a meditation yeah. tool more than an addiction of any kind. Which we're getting to the cigars. Yeah, for sure. So I felt like I went to Jeremiah and said, or maybe Matt, I don't remember, but I said, hey, I smoke cigars. Is that okay or is that a no-go? So they went to Daddy oh Baker. Oh, my gosh. And he came back and he said, that would be okay just don't tell anyone and that's when i was like 
meh, I'm out. That's not the right response. It can be like, yeah, that's fine. Don't do it on the church premise. Yeah. yeah. This is before social media. Like, that's like a right. different thing. Well, it was kind of MySpace a little bit. A little bit, but you weren't posting no. mere pictures of you smoking a cigar. Right, right. So that, I don't know. And that, uh, I think that really shaped a lot of my beliefs today. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That was, that was tough. But I don't know. I've, I never look back and regretted it. No. So. And we still stayed in touch a little bit after, too. I remember we would golf and stuff. Like, when mm-hmm. I was in, like, I feel like early college or, like, senior in high school, we would, like, go golfing. And that's your profile picture on my phone still is a picture from us golfing. Uh, which is yours really is still something. Oh, something old? Yeah. Um, that last one was gross. I am not eating another one well, of those. There's one. Maybe that one later. So, I don't even remember what we were talking about. So, we were talking about Matt, I think. Why you left. Oh, and the... Yeah. <clears throat> you just kind of press the side in there. Just stop. There we go. house fire yeah i that's something that i thought of probably around the time that we started talking again not that we made it a point to not talk but life children yeah <clears throat> business when i came out i think the first time to get my hair cut yeah um it crossed my mind i thought i don't think i really ever told anyone why i was leaving so there's some closure or something it's all good it's not like you went away it was you were always near which was nice as far as um bands you said you started with like covers like typical stuff Mm -hmm. like that when did you start writing and what did that process look like for you it's been weird i've always looked at myself as a writer very differently i try to write like original stuff but I feel like my expertise is in making something better and taking what somebody else has and working with that. And so that was like my big thing. And so doing the stuff at church and just playing all the time, I was always envious of the guys that were playing like dingy bars and stuff like that. I just never got to do that really. And so I was just always playing at church, you know, good church kid like that. And it's always what I'm doing. So, like, when I went to college, I went to Christian college, and they had these bands that would tour for the university that had, um, you would get scholarship money, basically, right? So, you would play for the university, you would travel, doing worship for events, and doing worship for the school, and, uh, I, one of my friends, who was, like, we knew from, like, Tyrone, that's where he was from. He uh, matches too. You're good. He was like, "Hey, you should try out for this. You should do it." And I was like, nah, "I'm good." And so I was just kind of playing at like some local church as well as at school. So the next year come along, I kind of understand more what that group does, and uh, I try out. And I was like, "You know what? I'm going to try out." And this looks fun. And they had already what I didn't know is they already had in mind of who they wanted to have on this team. Because it was somebody that was already at school for a full ride. So, like, they wouldn't actually be giving him scholarship money and stuff. And, uh, and this other kid who was just extremely good. And I still tried out and did my thing. And uh, the other kid they wanted to give the scholarship to, or had the scholarship they wanted to give him the spot on the team, just flubbed his audition horribly. And my audition went extremely well. I was, like, really happy with it. And so I made this traveling band. So I signed a contract. We were we had to put out an album. We played in chapel almost every day. And then we would tour all summer doing like camps, retreats, festivals. Would it be recorded in house? Like with your yeah, media we would, department? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's nice. Yeah, it was it was cool. And I got scholarship money and yeah, I like thoroughly enjoyed it. And that's what really kind of pushed me to like I need to get even better now. 
and like I was able to do the stuff at, at, at home and youth group and like do some kind of cool stuff here and there but now I'm like getting paid money to play and then from that I started getting paid by like these bigger churches not like mega churches but you know a few thousand people and they were like yeah we'll pay you to come play guitar and I was like great so I started booking those up doing those on the weekends and then I was just playing here playing there and just it was cool I was like I never thought I was gonna get paid to play guitar and then from then it just kind of just kept evolving from that and like working on some friends albums like hey will you work on this with me or hey will you come fill in for this and just fun then I was a worship pastor for a while and you get to play guitar every day and it was awesome like so that was it was fun for me for a while Mm mm-hmm and then I have my group um, that we do stuff now. It's still in the sim, similar, almost exactly the same vein, like doing church stuff and youth camps and retreats and festivals. And it's still, I think it's it's different because, like you were saying earlier, I think I can tell that you're putting your own spin on things. Yeah, and from what I've watched, it just it just feels to open like it opens it up so much more and yeah and that's like kind of what i always wanted to do when i was playing at places like i was it's so weird with like the praise and worship field right like certain guitars are in and certain guitars are out and you can't use this and it's very weird and i was always playing a les paul and just cranking it and super distorted it's and, probably whichever guitar company gives most to for uh what's it, it called <laughs> well, penance? Are you talking no, about like penance, penance and like the Catholic Church? No. Uh, <laughs> wow. Why can I not remember this? Hillsong collection. The collection. Oh, the plate. collection plate. Yeah, it's probably whichever guitar company gives the most. It was honestly like whichever worship team was big at the time and whatever they were playing. Mm. And then that was like, oh, this is the end thing. You know, I, that's funny because that was very faith during the Hillsong era. Mm -hmm. Yes. We were constantly trying to emulate Hillsong. Now, look at Hillsong. Have you seen any of the scandal that's going down? The one with Brian? Brian Houston? Like the 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 head pastor? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. What? I mean, I I know just enough that I'm like... It was with his... hmm. It wasn't with Brian. It was with his dad. So, Brian Houston is the senior pastor of Hillsong Church. And there were sexual allegations about his dad that came out. Oh. Because, like, it's, and I could be totally off, but, like, it's something along the lines of Brian's dad started a church, and Brian was there, and then that kind of broke off and became Hillsong and came huge under Brian's watch. But his dad had some weird stuff go down, probably sexual allegations stuff, like it is with everyone, right? And um, that happened before the merger, and then after the merger, I believe he was, like, on staff somewhat like slightly yeah and was still you know doing stuff just enough on staff to make the news from what i understand though brian from before the church merged apparently he like tried to address it and figure that out but then the stuff after they emerge they're so big he had no idea which is not an excuse well paterno tried to address the sandusky mess he did are you a paterno fan i am oh you motherfucker you well, he, the only thing I do know about the Paterno thing, the cop that Paterno told, do you know where he is? Huh. Nowhere. He quit. <laughs> he quit and fled and it's gone. But I mean, all this stuff still always comes down to wherever there's going to be an infrastructure of power yes. or a perceived head of something, you're always going to have manipulation and you're always going to have like scandal and yeah i was literally on the way here i was listening to the rise and fall of uh mars hill hmm. mark driscoll do you know about mark driscoll mm-hmm. and i'll just it's the, not it's insane in depth no but enough that you know pastor swearing behind the pulpit super hyper masculine stuff graphic sex things he would talk about on sundays and is this a christian podcast yeah, Christianity Today is doing it, wow. and that's all. Because I was like, I was hoping it was someone just like talking so much shit yeah. on what was going I, on. I would like to hear both sides of yeah. it. I mean, they they're pretty down the road, and they're not like anything in the way of Mark. It's pretty insane, huh? Because like, huh. it's just a thing, like like what you're talking about with uh, brand new. Yeah, and just the yeah. whole 
music and pop up scene and everything. What all time low now? I'm sure all time low. I just saw something because they always hang bras on their microphone stands, which I mean that's just the cliche. That's go the thing back you do, to but... the Mark Travis and Tom or Mark Tom oh, Travis yeah, show. The, the Listen album. to that mm-hmm. and tell me how any of that would fly right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think about that a lot. How certain ones just kind of squeaked under. I don't know. I mean, everything from slamming gays. Yeah. Like, I'm not even going into that. But what I what I think is cool right now, and it's funny because like what the church i mean let's get into this right i don't know for anyone that's watching i have a degree in theology and biblical studies i was a pastor full-time for a while i am not a pastor anymore i still work with the church in local churches and certain things but i am not a pastor but it's it's cool seeing people get up in arms about like deconstruction and like people like really analyzing things for themselves because i feel like our generation as a whole with what you were saying earlier when as soon as we hear or see something that doesn't seem right or wasn't like what was taught to us we question it and that's what a lot of people are doing Mm -hmm. it's like this doesn't seem right why are we why are we bashing you know the lgbtq plus ia ia plus community why are we bashing people we were literally told to love our neighbor why why are we bashing people and saying certain people go to hell and certain people are not and you know the rise of trump and just that hyper masculinity and like the crash and crudeness and kind of people in the church backing that has changed a lot of things and Mm -hmm. it's really interesting to see how 10 years ago it was supposed to be like super soft quote unquote seeker sensitive let the outsider in love your neighbor love everybody and now it's like nope hate this person <laughs> bash mm-hmm. this person you only vote for Trump it's like it's ins- it's crazy but yeah. I just like seeing people think for themselves I mm-hmm. really appreciate that which is definitely a rarity you were talking about were you talking about still earlier at my band yeah still yeah well I think I asked when you started writing music yeah. or and then I guess kind of how that progressed. Mm-hmm. You were saying like what we do is like way different. Mm, and that's yeah. what made me think. Yeah. I was thinking like the way that I think is really cool about what we do is we're well, we were five guys. We're like four now. Um, but everybody in the band was in another band at some point and was playing bars, clubs, doing little tours, like really doing it right the thing that i never really got to do and what i was doing was playing to mega churches thousands of people and getting paid to do it and they're you know so it was this very weird dichotomy but i always wanted to do what they were doing Mm -hmm. and they always wanted to make more money so whenever we were doing camp together for the first time and kind of got everybody together it was just like a no-brainer i was like this is this is different this is cool this is artistic and I think Christian music and CCM music in general is like really terrible. Yeah. And what we were doing was like, all right, well, this is a song that's popular. How do we make this good? How do we make this better? And that's what we started doing and writing stuff. And it it landed really well and picked up some steam with, uh, you know, on the internet and like with some local people. And we're just like, hey, let's, let's continue to do this. Let's see where it goes. And that's just where it's been. So I'm definitely proud of, of the guys in the group and like what – each of them bring to the table and it's also weird that everyone in our group except for one person used to front a band so when you have Mm. four uh do you get in some arguments oh yeah absolutely yeah absolutely uh it wasn't practice if we weren't yelling at each other (laughs) but we we've started to figure it out we've been together for like four years now yeah i i feel like a situation like that you would either come out of it so much stronger on the other end or just like, we're I'm still, done. We're still together. So Ow. it's been going good. But yeah, it could be tough. And like my thing I always try to look at it is like, what does everybody in our group do really well? Right? Like I think our, our, our Tyler, our front man, because he mainly sings, is just extremely talented. And like the groups he was in before were just, they were really good. And um, 
our drummer is insane i love our drummer he's just super good he's not that he's the ringo in the sense of he just sits there but he is super positive about everything yeah. and he has great ideas we just need to listen to him more and uh like and that's matt matt yeah he works okay. at the barbershop with me and then dan who sings and plays guitar just super strong voice really balances tyler out really well he's the one with the music man yes or, mm-hmm. he reminds me of a guy i used to work with named ryan adams why do i know that name because it kind of sounds like brian adams maybe maybe but ryan adams he he's from like the carlisle area i believe okay but then he worked at wjc when uh, I was there. Okay. but yeah when you sent me clips yeah to cut that i was like is that ryan <laughs> did he grow his hair out yeah, yeah. And then, like, there's me who um, doesn't really bring ideas to the table a lot. I'll take, like, what I was saying, like, what I think I do better is, like, they'll have, like, a progression and some lyrics. And I'll be like, hey, maybe this will rhyme a little bit better. Maybe it won't. And, you know, maybe this will, you know, just kind of push buttons here or there. And then when it comes to, like, writing, like, hooks and leads, I think I'm pretty good at that. And so I'll just be like, all right, let me kind of shut some things out. Let me figure out what I want to do. Do it feel the vibe and then bring it back in and so i think it works really well because we're super guitar and drum heavy yeah and so that i just think that's a really big deal with what we do mm-hmm. and uh yeah i love that music video that you did is that girl in the band jordan jd um yes yes and no like she she plays with us a lot but she doesn't play everything with us she's a solo artist on her uh, own okay she goes by noah jordan and she has really cool solo stuff, and she has like a, a Steelers podcast. He's called Helmet Hair. It's like a Steelers? Pittsburgh. She's a Pittsburgh sports nut, man. So she like works with wow. like a couple different podcasts, doing like sports podcasting. And so she does that. So she works like she's doing an event with us next week, but she's not at every single event. But mm-hmm. we do try to definitely have her as much as we can. Yeah. Um, but sometimes when it's just like a smaller thing, we don't need. The, maybe the, sometimes the less people is a little bit better and so we just kind of do that yeah um yeah. yeah so i just think we we would just gel really well and that video was super dope can we can we cut to the video Saturday was silent. cut to the video i'll yeah. get a copyright strike or some <laughs> shit <laughs> i'll try not to copyright strike you <laughs> but that one was sick i love that video did a great job that was oh god that was super taxing on my computer because i just layered all of it and then cut out what i didn't want Mm -hmm. or changed opacity i mean i had it ready i feel like i i shot it i feel like i helped i don't know if i was the director maybe i was the producer and you directed it and finally got to the end vision of what i really wanted and it was so much better yeah it was just it was super good yeah when i don't even remember how you first told me but i just remember thinking okay it's like one camera angle multiple times how do you do anything with that well that was like the original idea is like we uh, the guys based it off of another video i think i sent it to you mm, and it's like dudes mm -hmm. again that are backlit in a room it's in black and white and all the lyrics come up on a wall and it's just silhouetted and it looked cool but it was like a metal thing and it didn't fit for that but i was like i really want to do this differently Mm -hmm. and matt came up with the original idea of like how i think it turned out and i him and i kind of like were like just throwing things at the wall and seeing what we could do and then that was kind of like my idea and uh some of the guys weren't like super happy about it at the beginning um but i think it turned out really well i mean i'm really happy with it it's our fastest growing video every month ever since it's been up and uh doing doing okay so i dig it it got us a couple bookings just based off that video so that was you know it did it did the job it was intended Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm super happy with it. I messed up when I shot it. I didn't, I didn't lock the ISO. I was a little disappointed with myself in that. You got through it. Just lots of masks. A lot of masks. Lot of and masks. it looks sweet. I'm really happy with it. But we've just been lucky to have like a lot of people work on videos for us so far. And mm-hmm. I feel like 
for as not you know we're not huge by any means but for the size that we are i think our videos are better than bands that are significantly larger than us mm-hmm. and uh and they capture like our energy because mm-hmm. that's like another thing i feel like with that space is just there's so many people that have to be sheltered with what they're doing or they're not allowed to be themselves because it takes the focus away or whatever and it's just like man right i'm always like i just grew up going to shows and listening to punk and pop punk and hardcore and just like headbanging is just a thing of what i want to do when i'm holding a guitar so mm-hmm. we get to do that in the field that we do it and i think that's what you know it's it's authentic back right. to what we were talking about just people seeing authenticity with right. for what it actually is and that's cool yeah and just being able to be passionate about something and yeah. not worry how it's gonna look or how people are gonna look at you it's just you know what i'm doing yeah. what i love i'm doing me yeah but and it's been cool too with like not being associated with a any individual organization or anything like that we're a completely separate entity we're our own business our own brand and can do what we want and mm-hmm. I, I do appreciate that and we don't have anybody kind of looking down our throats like how a lot of people in that space would be right, right. so it's been good so you were talking about guitar earlier and how like how it was kind of eye-opening when you mm-hmm. first realized hey i could make money doing something that i really enjoy was it kind of the same way with cutting hair kinda so like with cutting hair my mom always had her license and i never went to anybody to get, i never went to a shop to get a haircut ever i didn't step into a barber shop until i was like 23 and uh my mom just always cut my hair because she had her cosmetology license and that's all i knew and you know, I thought about it just a couple of times as a kid, but I was like, all I knew was women's hair, right? I was like, I don't want to work at a salon. That sounds terrible. And it would be. Um, but then in college, whenever I was touring with the, the university, I needed to cut my hair. And so I kind of knew enough. I was like trimming myself up on the road. I had like this faux hawk thing going on and I would just clean up my sides on the road and it was good enough to get me by and it was cool. Um, but what really started when I was working at Apple. Um, I had a coworker come in one day, and his hair was jacked up, like super bad. And I was like, "Dude, where did you go?" Oh, I went to the salon. I'm like, "Dude, I know how much you make. Like, you can go to a barber shop." I was like, "But you're pretty jacked up." I was like, "Why don't you come by my house? And I'll see if I can fix it." He's like, "Okay." So I came by my house and got my clippers out that I had and just. I was watching some YouTube videos and I just cut his hair. He liked it. And we just kept doing that. And another coworker saw it and was like, hey, can you cut my hair and cut that coworker's hair? And I was like, just doing a couple of coworkers at the beginning. And then I got um, let go from Apple and I had like a severance. And a lot of them were just like, you should, you should pursue this. You should look into it. And I was like, okay. The, the big thing with that was every time you Google how much does a barber make, at the time, it said $21,000 a year. I was like, that is less than I'm making now. So I went to my barber, and I asked him if that was true. And he was just like... That's always a tough conversation, yeah. though. He's like, do the, but he's like, do the math. How much is a haircut? At the time, it was like 20 bucks. I was like, okay, 20 bucks. He's like, 20 bucks. Even without a tip, 20 bucks. And I'm here for eight hours, and we do a haircut every 30 minutes. So that's... 14 to 16 haircuts a day times 20 times 5 times 50 and you tell me if that's 20,000 it's obviously significantly more and so I was like okay so I was like I'm gonna I'm thinking about going to barber school what do you think and he's like yeah I think you should do it it's like okay so I went to barber school got out of barber school and uh I worked at his shop at the beginning and his shop is you know one of the biggest in the city if not You know, one of the, if not the largest. Is apprenticeship part of the certificate? It can be. You can do two ways in the state of Pennsylvania. You can either go to barber school and do 1,250 hours, which is a minimum of nine months. Or you can do an apprenticeship under a master barber for 1,250 hours, minimum of nine months. So it's the same. So it it takes a while. Um, But I chose barber school because he wasn't apprenticing. And it's very hard to get someone to actually apprentice you, you know. So... I just did that. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make this career path. I have like 
unemployment slash you know severance that I can sustainably live off of. I had like a little tiny part time job to try to stretch that and make it work. And I'm like, I've never been on unemployment in my life. I'm just gonna take this and do the absolute best I can with it. And I was able to get to the end, start working in the shop, and then you know hit, just build up clientele and get better every day, and just kind of grew from there. Mm-hmm. And then so that's kind of where it started from cutting hair my mom cut my hair to cutting hair on the road to cut my coworkers' hair to i really think i should do this full time i was at my grandfather's funeral it's my dad's dad's funeral and i was like <laughs> looking at my dad and i was the barber school admissions called me and i was like dad i think i'm gonna go to barber school and he looks at me and he's like i think that's a bad idea i was like great so i'm definitely doing this and, uh, and you I hear did. that, Mark? Yo, Mark knows. You know he's watching this. Oh yeah, he's super. But I mean, he's proud of me now, from what I can can relate to. Hey, Mark, I'm coming to get some of those tractor wheels. <laughs> so that was hmm. it. And now I now I own two shops. And yeah, tell me about. No, first of all, let me say, I think one of the differences is with your shop. I feel like it's your. So I there's a high end salon in Johnstown. Okay. Called Pellis Salon. I don't care. Pellis? Um, Pellis. Okay. Um it's you walk in there. Did you ever watch regular show? Yeah. Trash boat, baby. Yeah. yeah. So like the real uptight people in like some of the episodes. Yeah. Like, oh, we'll have the <laughs> Whatever. whatever it is that's how i feel when i walk in there and it's i think they're marketing to a certain clientele and they're providing an experience to a certain clientele Absolutely. you i think you're appealing to the perfect clientele and i think the you're providing the experience there yeah. also a good service but also i just feel walking in there it could be because i know you but I yeah. think just everyone in there is true, and you're not the only one. I mean, like, I how do I put this? I love having my own shop. You know, being in somebody else's shop, even though it really elevated me and got me to where I wanted to be, skill wise, clientele wise, mental health speaking, it wasn't the greatest place for me to be at the time. So, being my own boss and just kind of just was that thing. Every time I, if I worked for somebody who understood how I was as a person. I was an asset. If I worked for someone who didn't, or even like, had like, you know, Matt Aguilar at church or whatever, like, I was not an asset. I was looked at as like a detriment. And so I was always trying to figure that out. Is this person going to understand me? How can I like do this? Or am I going to be a detriment? And so like, I was like, you know what? The whole reason I got into barbering to begin with is I just want to own my own shop, do my own thing. If I make just enough money to provide for me and my family, that's great. That's all I want. You're doing what you love. I'm just doing something that I don't hate getting up and going to work for every day. Just so happened that I was good at it. And like once I got my own shop and was able to like kind of like melt away that stress and like I walk to work. Like that's insane to me that I can literally go give my wife and my children a hug and kiss goodbye, walk down the street, say hello to my neighbor, say hello to my mailman, Gabe, who was awesome. And walk into my shop. It's, it's like, like a Mr. Rogers thing going on. Dude, he's the modern day Mr. McFeely. He's the punk rock Mr. McFeely, and he's the dopest mailman in existence. Huh. Shout out, huh. Gabe. I love Gabe. But yeah, and everyone, everyone loves Gabe. But it, it's cool. Like, and I get to listen to my whatever music I want to listen to every day. I get to talk about it. I try to make people laugh. Yeah, I get to talk constantly. And so, like, I got to put art on the wall that I like. So, like. There's like music stuff. There's nerdy stuff. There's oh the three rivers. Yeah, I have three rivers seats yeah, in my shops. Like, yeah, just like cool stuff. I get to dress it, and people come in all the time. They're like, I love the aesthetic of your shop, and I'm like, the aesthetic of my shop is just things that I like. Yeah, like it's just weird it's just to me. me. Yeah, so it's like I didn't. This I'm not selling this at IKEA or mm-hmm. anything. It's just, this is just things that I like. Yeah, but I, I mean, people really do come in, and they're like, I just wanted a clean shop, and I wanted a welcoming shop. Like, there's a giant pride flag in my window. Because, like, they gave them out for pride. And I was like, absolutely, we're going to do stuff for pride. I sold cupcakes. And we donated all the money to a local youth organization. And I was like, and then they're like, oh, everyone started taking their flags down after pride. And I was like, why? There's no there's no reason to. Mm-hmm. And so mine proudly hangs in the window. Because we let, we welcome literally everyone. And we want everyone to have a good time. And 
you know, I, like I am encountering a weird thing right now where I've been at the same prices for like five years. Yeah, I got the book CEO. Yeah. And I was, you know, I had a little anxiety about raising my prices a little bit. Five dollars. Just because the, the market is insane. Which, five dollars, think about this. What do you spend if you stop at Dunkin'? At least five dollars. At least $5. Starbucks, Taco Bell. Starbucks, you can't even get out without less than seven. That's yeah, but people will bitch about it. Yeah, but but no one has said a word about it. Every I've got multiple emails, people coming in, just being like, "You should have raised your prices a long time ago." Mm-hmm. Um, don't feel bad about this. No, and those are the customers you want to keep too. Exactly. Yeah, and it's like, look, I'm not trying to like make more money off of you. Like, yes, we're more than likely going to profit more. But like the way I tell some people is like, if you wouldn't have gotten a raise at your job for five years, would you be upset about that? Or would mm-hmm. you be totally fine with it? Most people would be like, if I've been working for five years and not see a, any increase, yeah, I would have a problem. Mm-hmm. And so people have been really cool about it. And like, that's been, that's been great. And I love having the welcoming atmosphere. I absolutely love my team that I have right now. Um, that's like the hardest part is like, I know people complain about hiring people all the time, but in the barber world, you have to hire someone not only for their personality, but also like, how is their skill? How is their work ethic? You have a yeah. bunch of other things on top of just who they are as a person. And I've always been under the school of if they have, if they're the person you want to be around or they're the person you want to be there, I can make you better at what you do. I can impart my knowledge onto you and help you, you know, with yeah. whatever I have, but I can't make you a better person. Right. I just can't. But in my team, I absolutely adore my team now. They're the best. You were a pastor. I was a pastor. How does gay pride fit in with those beliefs? Is that somewhere that... Like where it was prior or where I am right now? I I, I guess both. Okay. I was pretty much raised to... I feel like I was raised to hate the Same. LGBTQ community. Same. I was on an anti-Disney kick until like 11th or 12th grade because Michael Eisner <laughs> had like gay day there. <laughs> but as far as like, I feel like I was just raised to like, it was so weird. Like, no, love your neighbor. Like, I love everybody. Everyone's unique. And then it's like, but if they're gay, they're going to hell. There's nothing there for them. They're terrible people. Stay away. Mm-hmm. It's like the gateway drug of like i don't know that you're you're gonna catch it or something stupid yeah yeah. and so like just like as i was like becoming more friends and clients you know these people that are coming into my shop and helping me provide for my family and i'm meeting people from all walks of life and i'm realizing that these people from all walks of life there can be good and greatness and people better than me in every area and just started like getting to know so many other people and i'm just like thinking about it and it never sat with me right at the beginning and you know i can read not well but i can study greek and hebrew and like the original context of the bible and like the way that i have read it that even you know to me it's not a big deal there's always been people of of we had eunuchs and you have like people that were gay all throughout history and it was never really an issue and I don't know. It's just like, to me, it's just like, why are we, why are we dictating and trying to tell people all the time? What is right? What is wrong? Like there's a moral compass for sure. And I think more above anything, the reason why today, and I had an argument with somebody about this is like, do you think, why do you think like Christianity is still around? Like, why is it a a, a thing that is so prevalent? You know, at least thousands of years. And I I really do believe that, like, the actual teachings that Christ taught are, you know, you find a lot of them in other areas as well, but, like, they are, they're great. They're solid. He was super counterculture, and that's why I think we still talk about it today more than anything. And I do agree with those, and I think the church, at least the American church today, doesn't look like any of them like right. at all i don't I think they look like you, any of them what do you think he would say oh he right be, now if if he was alive and <laughs> talking to people he would just be like 
you're an idiot. Like this is completely wrong. Yeah. In every aspect. Yeah. Like you're not helping your neighbor. You're not loving people. You're not giving to the poor. You're not helping your community. You're literally worried about celebrity. You're worried about politics. You're worried about anti-vax and all this nonsense and everything is divisive and everything is trying to up, up the next. And it's, it's insanity to me. I Mm -hmm. don't, I don't understand it. Yeah. I'm out. Mm. Well, I mean, you can rely or you can have another cigar. I mean, no, I'll finish this. You got me talking. I wasn't able to keep my puffing. I'm not, I'm not one for relighting. I just feel like if it just went out, I think it's fine. You can, you do you. I'm just saying for me, my dad, growing up, my dad would always put cigars out and then relight them later. And it's just, I can't do that. that. I had one at Thanksgiving. It was so cold and it was so good. And it came in like the glass Mm -hmm. and I was like, all right, I'm going to snuff it real quick, put it in the glass and I'm just going to try it tomorrow and see if it is fine. And it was, it was only not terribly many hours later and it was great, but with me, I just, oh. if I start talking or something, I'm just like, it'll, mm-hmm. it'll go out. When did you open? 2009? Mm, yeah. 10? So Clark Barber Co. was open on my anniversary, March 11th, 2019. So now you're coming up on... Coming up on three. Three years. Yep. When will the second shop be up and running? It's been up. It's been up for like two months. Oh, mm-hmm. I I thought you were just in the process of acquiring the. No, we got it done in wow. like four weeks. Yeah, and they're booking it with real estate now. Yeah, well, for, what's cool like, is I have a par- I have a business partner. So the reason the second shop isn't another Clark Barber Co. is I have a fifty fifty partner. Okay, who used to I cut thought hair I saw me. something about that on. Mm-hmm. I don't know somewhere. He has a he has an extremely successful shop as well. We've always worked really good together. We're very good at different things, and we were just like, hey, we should. We should put our money together in front of something together that could be, you know, grown and been organic and like just do its own thing. And so that's what we did. We found the the um, the guy that owned the building. His assistant was a client of my business partner, and I know him too. He's an amazing guy. And uh, he was like, "Hey guys, like this was a shop. I really think you should do something here. It's a really good space. I'll cut you a deal on the rent. I really think you should do it." And so we got got it together, talked to the wives, and we're like, hey, let's at least try yeah. it. Yeah. How did that go? Good. Were they? Yeah. They were both fine. I mean, nice. his wife does hair as well. And my wife was just like, all right. And she, she knows that once I have something set in my mind, mm-hmm. if I think I can make it successful, I'm going to do yeah. it. It's just it. And so she's just going to be encouraging and go for it. But um, yeah. So yeah, we got it all done in about four or five weeks. And we were open at the end of October. And so we're going to month two it's not it's not popping off like either of our shops are because it doesn't you know we're not there it's not our names on our clients but um they do great work it's a good shop and we're just kind of growing it the right way so that it can be sustainable the right way so talking about how i think you're selling not just haircut it's the environment the atmosphere yeah. what would you say some of the differences are between what you have and that one and I'm, you can talk. I want to check this. Yeah, go for it. Um, my shop in Millville, the Clark Barber Co., is like really tiny. And I love that environment where like everyone is just super close and almost on top of each other. And it's one communal conversation. And I absolutely adore it. And uh, that's... It's like the same at the new one. It's just a, it's just a lot. It's like twice the size. Mm-hmm. Same amount of chairs, but twice the space. You know, it's off Midnight Road, which is like one of the busiest, you know, shopping suburban areas in Pittsburgh. And it's right in front of Ross Park Mall. So, like, it's different in that environment that it's not the small town feel. But once you walk inside of it, it'd be hard pressed to be able to tell the difference. Mm-hmm. There's three river seats. I was like, I had to have that. Like an old vintage Chesterfield couch in there playing the same type of music same workbenches and like similar chairs and mm-hmm. same color scheme going on bunch of flash tattoo art and everything like that and yeah, it's yeah. just a clean look I, yeah. I love it and so yeah we called it highborn it's highborn barber company we were trying to figure out something and i wanted to go with like just something that meant like noble or like worthy or just like respectable and so we looked at a couple things and they were taken and i found I was like highborn. I just found, looked that up, you know, saw what it meant, and 
It's like, yeah, absolutely. You know, hmm. um, you know, born of stature or to a uh, to stature, and you're just like, you're you're yeah. This is a place for you. Come, mm-hmm. you come here. This, we're not trying to be bougie in any way. We think everybody is worthy of a great haircut. Yeah, we're not super expensive. We're not cheap by any means, but you're gonna get a custom haircut exactly for you in a very clean environment friendly environment good music good hangs you offer a hot towel finish right you can yeah okay. but not like the chains not in that way <laughs> but you can do that it's a lot of laundry at the end of the day but. yeah i'm sure that would be that would be something i mean i have sneakers from high school still oh same yeah yeah it's crazy I actually bought Case a pair of Converse, some Chucks, and uh, I took a picture of his and mine. I got I bought mine in two thousand one. Oh, I saw that picture. Yeah. Yeah, or maybe two thousand two. I don't. Yours remember. would be to crap though. Yeah, but I still love them, and I think about buying a new pair. I'm like, no, these have miles. These have memories. I'm I'm getting to the point with clothes. Like I I used to love just get a deal, and then I realized I just had all these clothes I wasn't wearing. So I started just yeah getting rid of a lot of stuff, and it felt great. Now I love getting rid of things and giving it away or whatever. But I pretty much like only live in like right now. It's Carhartt long T-shirts, Levi's five twelves, and Vans MTEs. That is my life. Mm-hmm. And I just live in it. Because I know what they're going to feel like. I know how they're going to fit. And I'm just going to... It's like the Steve Jobs approach, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Just not making as many decisions on, uh-huh. on what you're wearing. What's it called? De- uh, decision fatigue? Is that what it is? I think. And I just heard recently Zuck. Zuck's the same way. Zuck has a whole lot of issues. But, a lot of different issues. But, but it's a similar thing. Okay. So, meta. I think that people are going crazy thinking here comes the matrix oh they are but it's already here you're yeah. already completely absorbed into that 2d screen 100 percent. so it's I, i'm not worried about that i think it's the person behind the technology that mm-hmm. is what's troubling same with same with tesla same with amazon same with facebook it's the people behind it same with the government same with the government same with the church Absol- anywhere absolute. that there's money to be had anywhere where there is a power structure and there is a head of something mm-hmm. there will always be corruption and abuse always so like that's like what I mean, this isn't about me in any way but like the way i try to like get past that even in my own small space is like yes i own my own business Yes, my name's on the door, but like my guys are all technically subcontractors. They're all their own boss. They get to file their own taxes on their own terms and have their own write offs. Like, if I make a, a rule or something up, do they need to follow it? Yeah. But I always try to look at myself as just a, a, a tenured equal and not necessarily like someone at the top of this pyramid. Mm hmm. It's not some MLM. I'm not doing that. But like anywhere, like it's just with these bands, when you have like this, this person you're looking up to in these churches in business, like it's just, what is it? Power, absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's just what it is. I had Especially a teacher in, high in the church. say that to me and I just, a smart like, man. I don't understand that at all. And I think it was just a few years ago where I heard it and it must've just been the right time. You're like, oh, and I was crap. Like, that, that's okay. That's what that means. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. And just trying to, you know, being out of it for you know, like this church in that regard, as far as like working in one and everything, it, it helps give a really fresh perspective on a lot of things. And like my thing now is just like calling out anything that needs to be called out when it needs to be called out, not making excuses for literally anybody. And just treating everyone like they matter because they do, right? And that's it. Just love everybody. That's what you're. That's what you're taught to do as children, right? So, like, why are we not doing it now? Why is it different now? Oh, you voted that time. The guy met freaking state representative came to my barbershop. I'm not gonna say who it is, but she gave me her card and she's like, "If you ever need anything, please call me." I was like, 
cool. I was like, yeah, actually, I have another state representative client. I've been cutting his hair since before he was elected as a state representative. And she goes, who is it? And I said his name. And she goes, oh, he's on the other side of the aisle than me. And I was like, but like real pompous like that. And I was like, and I go, cool. I was like, I voted for you, lady. But uh, yeah, I don't care. Yeah. Like, still a person. Still care about him. Yeah. Still gave me a Cuban for Thanksgiving. It's a great guy. Like, I don't know. What do you want me to tell you? Like, it doesn't matter to me. Like, everyone, everyone matters. So I just can't get over, I just can't get over the fact that people create these structures of hierarchy that are just bullshit. I, I just talked with somebody else recently on one of these podcasts about that and how I think it's just because it's easier to put people in boxes and say, like, rather than get to know someone and know every aspect, they'll take Mm -hmm. one small detail of their life and judge their entire being off of that. It's super easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so easy. I mean, that's why stereotypes are a thing, right? Because, like, it's easy to put someone in a box and be like, well, this happened one time, so this is how it always is. And I will say I have one client who... um, It's trans. And I didn't even know. Like, just one of the absolute nicest, loving people in existence. And I kind of told my story. I was like, hey, I grew up in church. And, you know, I was just taught things that I don't believe now. And can I, like, can I, like, ask you questions about, like, what's the best way for me to handle this? What's the best way for me to, like, am I doing something that I, I shouldn't do? Right. And they have been the most loving, caring, thankful person that are just, they're just there. They're still a clear client of mine, but they're like, hey, what's the best way that I can help? What's mm-hmm. the best way I can subvert this? Like one time someone came in and I guess they felt uncomfortable. They were late for their appointment. And I think they were just feeling extra crappy about that. And they were like, I felt uncomfortable. And I just, you know, in the review, I just said, hey, I'm really sorry that we made you uncomfortable. Like, this is honestly the first time anyone's ever told us that. Thank you for telling us. And I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that doesn't happen again going forward. That's it. Did I think some of what they were complaining about was bogus? Absolutely. But the fact that someone felt uncomfortable meant that there's something I could do better. Mm-hmm. So I called up that client of mine and was like, hey, what can I do better in this instance? And they said, like, I actually think you did an absolutely amazing job. I genuinely don't think you could have done anything better but if there is something like here's a better way to approach it or here's a better way to kind of like listen to what they're saying maybe or you know what i mean i I don't really remember what it was exactly but and they're just there for me like thank you i don't know these things so like the if you're willing to learn and you're asking the questions to get better you can get over any terrible thing that you were taught Mm -hmm. growing up or like these people are like well i just had a bad situation at home or i had this or had that or my dad was around or you know whatever that's fine and that happens a lot and i'm sorry that it happened the real thing is what are you going to do next how are you going to make that better for yourself i mean being a parent i feel like that's a big thing like i started i have two stepsons i don't consider them stepsons they're just my sons Mm -hmm. but i only say that to say that they were older when i when my wife and I got married um, like three and five and I didn't get to go through the baby years which I think are really awesome and scary but I started parenting the way that I was parented and it just it just didn't work and I just kept trying to do it maybe maybe if I'm maybe if I'm louder maybe if I'm more stern maybe this is going to get better and it doesn't (laughs) Perfect time. Perfect time. VH1. Family reunion. Thank you for the ad. Uh, it just didn't work. And so the big thing for me was figuring that out. Like, it the, the didn't work. So, like, how am I going to do this? And I have all these this time that I put in doing it the way that obviously didn't work. And now looking back on it, I, I wish I wouldn't have done it that way. But you don't know any better. But the fact that you can take that instead of being like, well, it is what it is, and you know, whatever. Now I'm like, all right, how do I how do I do this differently? How do I parent differently? How do I treat people that work for me differently than the way that I was treated when I worked for somebody else? How do I talk to this person? How do I be more accepting and loving to this person? And just kind of try to figure out not exactly where everybody is, but enough to listen to what's going on. 
I think that's what a lot of people want. They just want to be heard sometimes. Absolutely. Like the person complaining, they might have just wanted to vent and then go on with their day. Yeah. And I'm hoping that like, you know, like they, they've never come back, which is totally cool. But like, I never want anyone else to feel like that way again. Right. And so that's what we're doing everything in our power, in our shop to make sure that never happens again. And you can, you can change. You just have to be willing to change. Mm -hmm. It's never going to be easy. It's going to be constant. I mean, like going through, like I'm, I'm in therapy and having a therapist and someone to talk to and listen to has been amazing. And just that introspective thought of just like, who am I? What am I feeling? What am I doing? Like that makes such a huge difference in figuring things out. And like, Mm -hmm. instead of like all your emotions, all your emotions are valid. Right. So instead of taking the path of least resistance of say, Hey, I get really angry when this happens or I get really introverted or anxious you know, and just taking the path of least resistance to that and saying like, wait, why do I want to get angry? Why do I want to revert? And feeling all those emotions out and figuring that out, like as a man in his thirties, figuring that out now with children is like a much bigger deal. And like my kids have valid emotions. Why are they feeling this way? Mm -hmm. Like I want to understand why they're feeling this way or what what did I do to maybe cause this or what can I do to help this? And like, that just you just apply that to everything in every situation and growing up i feel that that is so counter intuitive just complete opposite of how we were raised if someone was raising their kid like that when we were being raised oh, they were hippies like oh yeah, yeah. With those hippie parents yeah That's, exactly wow. and it was like you're going to be you're going to sit there you're going to be quiet uh-huh. you're going to be you're going to talk when spoken to. You're not going to smart. I smart will say back. there are some times when I still do that. I'm oh, like, yeah. You listen. These yeah, and that's, rats. A, that's a, it definitely <laughs> has its place. Like my middle son is just, he is every bit smart ass like me. And, uh, and I respect that. But then at the same time when he pulls it on me and he's mm-hmm. like, and he's like, I'm like, dang it. Uh, yeah. He's right. Mm-hmm. <sighs> and so like, I just have to be like, you know what? You're right. Yeah. And so, and then just kind of bring it back around. And so I think it's been helping immensely. And now like being like having my wife and I have a child together and he is like every bit of me just loud in super powerful emotions. And he gets upset at anything. Anybody that he's really happy. It's just like, it's scary when you see yourself and your kids, yeah. you're like, my wife looks at me like, what are we going to do? And I'm like, yeah. you know what? I don't know. The only thing I'm going to do is say is we're going to do the opposite of like what I remember just because it took me a long time to get to where I am. And I'm just going to try to better whatever that is. Mm-hmm. And so it's just, but you also, I think that is really hard with parenting, seeing those negative, your negative traits yeah. in your kids, but it's so worth it when you see the, good stuff yeah come out of them it just feels like i made that that's what that's what i'm hoping i mean oliver is turning four so i'm hoping that that's the case but like i can already see like perseverance like that's one thing with me it was just like like people are like yeah i tried to learn the guitar and it like hurt my fingers or I, I tried to do this like people that like, give up on things and that's something that i feel like as a kid i was like you're you're not allowed to give up on things but i also never wanted to give up on things i still don't still boy mm-hmm. like that. i if i think this will work i will make this work i will show you that this will work and i can see that in him already and uh so i'm excited to see like what with the right encouragement what things he's going to yeah. like do and break out of i'm very mm-hmm. excited for that yeah it, this generation is definitely promoting um something completely different from what we've been fed in the past it's yeah. it's not you don't need college if, nope. if find something that you want to do yep and that's I, I just love seeing that you'll have the passion when you find something you want to do just hey figure out a way to make money from it you can figure out how to sustain yourself you're gonna have a better quality of life you don't have to make six figures you don't have to do this or that like all you have to do is be able to provide for yourself and be happy it matters a ton 
and it is definitely harder in the climate for sure i mean like i'm in my 30s i i still look down upon myself because i don't own a home right i i have three businesses that i technically run right between the band and the two shops and they're all successful and i still don't own a house right and i'm like man why am i don't why why am i not this whenever i still have to just take a back and look and say this is what i did do i got here this is awesome mm-hmm. like it, it's just cool and that's like one of the reasons like i named my barber shop with like my last name it was just like i don't want it to be my first name it's like my last name covers more people than me my last name you know kind of shows where i came from and my last name is what my wife has is what my kids have like that's the thing it's that your i want legacy yeah and not that it's like my legacy but it's something right. that i can give them and be like hey like i couldn't do this without your mom helping me paint and build the shop literally at two in the morning like every night for months on end and you know this is something that i'm not going to push you down this career path but like i'll offer yeah. it to you like if you want to take it over by all means great mm-hmm. and so it's just more of like that family thing and it's just like i wanted to i wanted to do that and so and it's just crazy to think that i i did and i know a lot of people make like five-year plans and there's like what are you gonna do in five years we can do in 10 years but when i did leave apple i was like okay i'm legitimately gonna make a five-year plan of like i have a goal what is it gonna be and i i did that and i reached my five-year goal in i think it was three years I was like, wow. Okay. It's a little bit earlier than I thought. So then I was like, all right, here's another five year plan. And I reached that five year plan in two years. And I was like, okay, this is getting a little. Either I'm undershooting or I'm going really quickly. And so now I'm like stepping back and be like, okay, here's another five year plan. It's a little bit slower. And just trying to keep that perspective. Cause like instead of looking at it as like, just doing day by day what am i going to do what am i going to do it's like right, just, we're just going to slowly start walking toward the thing that we want to do and just let's make sure that each day we're taking a step towards it and hopefully we'll get there and luckily that you know that's been something that worked for me and i'm like really happy with that it's just crazy to think that right now where i am to think of like where i was when i first was thinking of it is like insanely <laughs> different it's like wow mm-hmm. that's i'm actually doing that thing and uh, it feels awesome but that's also the thing that school and college and adults are just like, my dad, you know, I think it's a bad idea. You know, or like in school, like when you, know, you get good grades or your honor society or, you know, whatever it is, it's like, if you don't go to college, you're a waste of space. Mm-hmm. You're an intelligent person. I was like, yeah, well, you know, every business, every avenue needs an intelligent person. And that's, you know, so like, just let them do what they want to do. Yeah. It's going to work. So... Amen. A woman. How, if you were to rate yourself on, um, because I know being a business owner with something that you're passionate about, it can suck your life away and you don't even realize. How do you balance work and owning shops and family? Or how... Do you think you're you have a good balance? Or? I think I think I have a good balance right now. <clears throat> like the big thing with me is it's like I set my hours originally with what I thought I would be the busiest. Then when I started being busy all the time, I changed my hours to be what gives me better time to be home <clears throat> and when am I going to be home? <clears throat> so like the big thing for me is like when I'm done, I'm done. People are like, "Hey, can you stay late?" No. If I'm going to stay late, you need to pay me for not only the service I'm providing you, but the time away from being at home. And guess what? That dollar is a lot higher than what it is. Because this is time that I set aside to be here. But if you're dipping into the pot that I give to my family, that costs a lot more. And that's not being selfish. That's just understanding where that needs to be. And so a lot of my clients have really respected it. And like, I even have like, professional athletes like hey can you come in earlier or do this i'm like maybe let me ask my wife like i know you play for whoever but i'm gonna figure this out and then they've been cool about it too like no we're just, i'll make an appointment great mm-hmm. and just making sure that it's the thing. now that we're doing like the second shop 
Um, I have changed my schedule a little bit and I talked to my wife about it and say, hey, here's the plan. I'm only going to be doing this for X amount of time. And, you know, I just want you to be aware of that. But if you need me for something or, you know, something comes up, just know that you're the first priority, that I will take care of whatever's going on over here to make sure that I'm for what you need. And same with my kids. Um, with the pandemic, it's been a little different. Like there's no sports to go to and stuff like that. And, uh, and but my kids have really found their element at home and like figuring out what their creative space is. And so I'm just encouraging that. Um, but I just really separate them and say, this is the time I'm giving. Like, it's like buckets. This is the amount of hours I have in this bucket. This is the amount of time it goes here. And I'm not trying to cross them in any way, shape or form. Now with the band, it gets a little bit differently because like we get sometimes we get like booking out of nowhere like this booking we have this week is just literally came just a couple weeks ago and they're like hey we know it's last minute but can you do it and i was like yeah i think we can do it and i just let my wife know like hey this is what's going on this is what we're doing and she understands that like that is definitely a passion of mine of just being able to play music and so she understands that and that's kind of my regenerative time of like getting my um energy back and uh so it works really well, but I'm just really adamant about this is work time, this is family time, and making sure that they I'm not giving more to work than I am at home. Mm-hmm. Like once things are up and running, like that's the goal. My goal now, like from working five days, like my goal in my five year plan is to be able to sustain, make the same amount of money, cut myself down to four days and give myself my family another day. That's mm-hmm. the goal. And I'm just going to keep working that because like barbers sometimes die behind the chair is like kind of the, the phrase, right? And they're going to die behind the chair and I just don't want to do that. So my goal is to be successful enough that I can eventually start slowing down and elevating the people around me and elevating people that work for me to make more money and be able to provide even more for themselves and in a great environment while I can spend more time at home or spend more time in another direction. Right. And so this right. is being very adamant about this goes here and this doesn't and making sure you know what piece fits what. Mm-hmm. I, I think I definitely respect that. I think for me, it's really been hard because it's something that like the client stuff pays the bills. Yeah. But I like my off time, I'm doing my own projects. Because the creative because that's stuff where, puts the juices back in. That's yes. what gets your battery recharged. And it's tough because if I don't have client work, then I'm like 12, 14, 16 hours a day working yeah. on my personal project. Yeah. And there's only so many weddings you're going to do before you're like, you've seen it all. Mm-hmm. No offense to any brides. I'm sorry, but... Uh, once you photo and video a certain number of weddings, you know what's going on. I will say, though, weddings are, for me, my mind is wrecked all day. Oh, Just yeah. trying to keep up with you everything. Got one capturing. shot, Eminem. Don't, don't miss your yeah. chance. Um, but I have to say that I really feel that I connect with the couple on a weird level. Yeah. And when I'm editing, sometimes I'll tear up, which is like not I've a man it. thing to say. No, but I cry that at weddings constantly. I never Baby. cried when I went. At my wedding, I thought I was going to bawl my eyes out, and I did. Oh, for your wedding? Yeah, yeah. I. Oh, you're saying when you went to the wedding, you didn't cry, but when you're watching it back, you're like, right. <laughs> I think it's like just packing all of that into like a five eight minute yeah. video with like the best yeah your through line is emotional you're like like, yeah and i connect with them and then i go to deliver because i always like to watch the video with the couple for the first time which i don't know i i feel might be a little bit creepy no i don't think so but i just like to see the emotion i think the first time i have someone say oh i don't like this then i'm not gonna watch them (laughs) anymore but yeah I, i just i like seeing that emotion absolutely I don't, I don't really know how we got there. What? Talking about that? Yeah. I don't know. But as far as like emotion, it's really funny. Like I, I love like that zero to 24 month, even like when the, the kids are like really little and 
everyone that like a lot of people know me like i'm a straight shooter right i don't like i'm not ever gonna like blow smoke i'm not gonna like kiss anyone's ass in any way shape or form but man when i see a baby i'm crumble so one of our bandmates had a uh, two of them had a baby at the same time and one of them brought it into band practice and matt who works with me is like my best friend he he understands but the other like the girl jd that plays with us she never had really been around and uh another bandmate and the baby came in and i just run and i just grab the baby and i pick the baby up and hold the baby just, just like loving on the baby walking around like do you want to hold her like no okay cool just like that's just my my place and she looks over at Matt. she's like is he always like this and he's like yeah he melts absolutely melts and it was just like mind-blowing like yeah like i cry at weddings i love romantic comedies like i'm super emotional but like in certain aspects like yeah. I, just, I don't know other things i'm just like no i'll tell it to your face i don't care if you cry yeah but that i'm like this this is my element right here i i a lot i have a lot to say about all of that i you said like zero to 24 months for me it's the like 24 months to like a couple years when that's they can the most really, fun yes but when if it's somebody else's baby it's somebody I'm, else's baby that squishy face when their face is still squished they're oh. so cute they can't they can't back talk with 24 yeah. to 48 they can back talk but they're the most fun True. to be around right like with your children right. that two to five is the best yeah well and now they're teenagers so i, I don't lock on my door yeah <laughs> and a security camera <laughs> so i feel you on that one. Oh well oh well no more uh chocolate alcohol no i'm good they're pretty nasty i'm not gonna lie i'm not a big sweets guy man mm, i love sweets yeah my wife and my children are all like chocoholics. Mm-hmm. I can't do it. I, it's it's tough. I over the past like three months, I've dropped maybe twenty pounds. Wow! And I just started trying to be more conscious of what I was putting into my body yeah. or how much really. Not I wasn't eating better foods. It was just one donut instead eating of three. Less. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and cutting out iced tea, I would drink iced tea nonstop all day. Now, mainly water, Red Bull. Yeah. Um, but then Liz started buying snack cakes. Like tasty cakes? Uh huh. Yeah. And one day she said, How much do you weigh? It's like, oh, I just weighed myself this morning. It was like 156. Next thing I know, there's like sam's club size snack cakes in the <laughs> pantry i'm like you man why why are you trying to ruin me i'm like, so good i will wake up in the mornings and sometimes i will walk downstairs and my wife was passed out on the couch with like candy wrappers just like on the side of the couch and just like so I like pick up the candy wrapper, grab her. It's like she's like an alcoholic, but with candy. Mm-hmm. Like plug her phone and <laughs> throw the wrappers away. I'm like, okay. It's like, hey, good morning. How was? It looks like you had a great time yeah, last night. Yeah. It's crazy. Like, that's her thing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I like I like some desserts, but to me, it was always like I'd rather have like more whatever the main course was than eat dessert like we didn't always have dessert so yeah. it's like whatever i i think i'm i'm definitely like that with home cooking mm. anytime if whatever liz makes i'll pound that and it doesn't matter what is for dessert i would rather have more of the food but if i'm just walking through the kitchen during the yeah. day my vice as far as those bars. are concerned are you ever have like they're like panda cookies they're like Meyer and Meijer panda cookies. They're from they're like oh, Japanese. Yeah. Are they like the straw things that are dipped? They're similar the like pokey? to pokey. They're similar to pokey, but they're like a little tiny cookie shaped like a panda bear with like a little chocolate fudge filling. Mm. They're not very sweet. Just mm. a little bit of sweet. Those things are going to crush them. i try it out. One of my Asian friends turned me on to it and I was like, now like... I'm that white guy going through the Asian grocery store, like throwing treats in there and grabbing ramen and like, like, yeah. hey everybody, like you know, and then just well, leaving to go to. Dude, have you? Do you have like an Asian grocery store right here? Oh no, dude, that's what you gotta get when you. We have Walmart, Giant Eagle. You sure you don't have one in like 
you just don't know about it. We have some kind of Italian meat market <laughs> called Canzati's. Yeah. They come from all over for that meat. <laughs> yeah, they seriously do. But I, I'm not sure if we have any kind of... Like Asian market? Yeah. I love it. I love the Asian market. It's so good. Hmm. It's cool because it has like... You have like Japanese stuff, Korean stuff, Chinese stuff. We have like everything over from Asia. So it's not just like one particular nation mm. and it's just so much good stuff it's awesome i'm i'm not a very my palate is not very broad yeah so i'm good with my taco bell occasional <laughs> mcdonald's we have some good mexican places around here i yeah i actually saw some like hispanic people and i was like driving over here i was like wow it's cool. yeah yeah it just it, i try to explain people that all the time like because i live like in in pittsburgh and people are like, why are there not, like, many Hispanics? Why are there not many Asians? Like, why is Pittsburgh, like, super white? And it always, like, gets it's a little infuriating. Like, I wish we were more diverse in Pittsburgh. We're not. But the reason for that is, do you know the reason why Pittsburgh is not, like, crazy diverse? I Isn't it similar in a lot of cities where there are different, like, pockets of... There's a very, very small Asian pocket over in, like, uh, Squirrel Hill. But that's, like... It's, it's very small um no it's because like when everyone was coming over from europe and going through like new york and all the ports they were already had tons of immigrants in the major cities like in philadelphia and new york and boston all those coastal cities and there just wasn't anywhere for them to set up whatever they came over to do whether it was like a bakery or whether it was a butcher or like whatever their job was so a lot of them a lot of the european immigrants just kept coming west and because of the three rivers you know pittsburgh became a city and so you had a bunch of factory workers and steel mills and all that and you had everybody move out there and so you just had like you had italians you had polish you had uh, you know just like all forms of caucasian immigrants very light-skinned people all coming and working the factories starting and that's where you have all these you know you have like a little jewish area italian area polish hill you have like all the, these different conglomerate of like nationalities coming but they're all white and so there was no hierarchy per se of like ah well the asians are gonna do this and the hispanics are gonna do this and it just really wasn't that so everyone just kind of filtered in and it just that's why you have like chinatown and all the other east coast major cities but you don't have that in pittsburgh um so it's like trying to explain that why we have a lack of diversity um it's changing a little bit but because of like tech is coming in so you have everybody from all walks of life coming but we just don't have those cool little like pockets like some major mm -hmm. cities do that's the only thing that stinks hmm. but when you find the little asian grocery store and and like all that then it's like awesome it's like i don't miss living in the country at all yeah because i can go to like the hispanic market and go down to the middle eastern market and go to the asian market and like kind of just try to you know, understand where people are at when you understand someone's food i feel like that makes a big difference like when somebody comes to the shop from like a different nation i'd be like hey have you found a place here that reminds you of home to eat and whatever they say i will go hmm. and i'm just trying it out i want to know what you what reminds you of home mm -hmm. and you just get some good stuff it's great i can't i can't do it i mean i'm not gonna eat frog legs or something i'm not that bad but i'll mm. go down there like i love being the only white guy in there it's great so good i don't think i really have much else the i think the last thing that i wanted to ask is you just seem like you said you have the persistence like you're talking about your son yeah like, what, what what about you what do you think drives you as hard as you seem to be driven you'll pick something like guitar and say i'm going all in or i'm like with the sh the barber shop yeah man i don't know that's a really great question I think like part of it, part of it is flaw and part of it is work ethic. I think my grandfather and my dad, um, two men, you know, that I respect, um, with insane work ethic. And so if something was ever going to fail, I think I always wanted it to fail 
and never have any reason to blame the amount of effort that I put into it. And I think part of it is, is like my mild OCD. Like if you're going to do something, you need to just, you need to actually do it and you have to do it until you have no other excuse for why it failed other than, you know, know, as, as far as what your, your effort that you put into it is. And so I just, I want to do it. Like if I'm going to do it, it was like, you need to do it to the best of your ability. And I think that's part of like some positive, like growing up being like, Hey, you have a lot of potential or you are very intelligent or like whatever, you know, adults would tell you as a kid, that would be like very pro whatever you're doing. Um, and just kind of doing that. And so when I, for me, I'm like a big thinker. Like I'm like, okay, like I really want, if I'm going to do this, my wife gets really mad. She's like, you look at everything and you figure out how you can make money from it. And I'm like, kind of, I look at everything and figure out how can I make this sustainable enough for me to do it? Like if I want to invest in this area, I don't want it to just be a complete pit that I throw money into. That's fine for some things. But for me, it's like, I want to make sure I can justify this. And so with barbering, it was just like, all right, I literally, I have a degree in one thing. I started a, a degree in another thing for, I was going to school for computer information systems when I worked at Apple and, and I quit all of that to do this third thing. And I'm like, let's make this third thing work. If I'm gonna make it work, I'm gonna make it work. And so that's what I did and just went full bore at it. And like, even when I was like working, when I was wanting to be a full-time pastor, I was working like two, three jobs just to sustain the ability for me to be working at a church, which I shouldn't have been doing to begin with. But, um, it's just kind of throwing myself fully into something. Part of it is OCD and part of it's just like, I have to make sure that it is or it isn't the right thing with the first two before the shops. Yeah. What, what was the sign for you to know it was time to close the door at church? Like like with that and with Apple or with Apple, it was like super, super terrible environment. And the people that like, I just went to a friend's birthday party. That was a bunch of Apple employees and they're just like, they were like, I'm, we're like, we're really jealous and proud of like what you've done because this sucks. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah. And it was just the right time. It was like, I mean, I got, it was a new management and she really didn't like me. So she could find a way to get rid of me. But you know, they, I had a severance and, and an unemployment and everything. And I was like, all right, I've never had this. I need to have this time. So for me, like it was, it was the time of just like, look, if you don't say go now, you're never going to say go. And when it came to opening my own shop, um, that was like in the fall of 2018. And I had already been planning on starting my own shop spring of 19, but closer to early summer. Like I wanted to really give myself some time and I've been putting some money back, but I had no idea where I had ideas, but I really didn't know. And um, (laughs) the guy that I was working for fired me via text message because he had hired somebody else and he needed to make room. And so he was making up this thing, this excuse to get rid of me. And I was like, if I don't do this now, I'm going to find somewhere else. It's going to take me a while to settle back in and all that. And I'm going to get comfortable again. And it's just like, you have to try. And you have, so you have, yes, you wanted to save X amount of money, but like you got three quarter of that. Can you make it work? Cool. Go for it. And so with the you know, help of my wife and just like encouragement, it's like, okay, this is when I need to do it. And like, whenever I was like leaving, working in church full time, I was working at a church plant and wasn't getting paid. And one, two, three, four, five different staff members left at the same time. There was like some stuff going down in the church and like the senior pastor ran away from it and it just wasn't good. And uh, so I just looked at it and I was like, I'm tired of this. This is not what I, what I want. I want to be working three jobs to deal with this nonsense. So I said, I'm going to help this <clears throat> church plant through what they're going through, get them into the area of being able to, so me leaving doesn't add to what's going on. I'm going to give it some time, help them get through. But like, if I don't, if I don't jump now, like this is an ample opportunity. And so that's exactly what I did. I was like, as soon as this is over, I'm out starting bar and started barber school like the next week. And that was it. So it's just kind of like, it's that mixture of trying to be prepared and also like 
not necessarily dumb luck, but just like you're going to have to do it. If you don't do it now, you're not going to do it. And that's really what it is. Trying to never be insanely comfortable. And like now that I am insanely comfortable, but I'm insanely comfortable because of what the, all of the crap and the work that I did to get to this point, I'm still trying to not be comfortable. It's like, okay. Um, my five-year plan was open another shop, but this opportunity came. It seems like a great opportunity. If I don't do it, am I going to regret not doing it? Okay, let's go for it. I'm just kind of going at it, but making sure I don't overstretch myself enough that I'm not there for my family. I'm not, you know, trying to, I don't know, get rich or whatever people may think. It's just more of like a, when you have the opportunity in front of you, are you going to take it? Or are you just going to sit back and be like, mm, I don't know. And then five years, 10 years down the road, you're like, what would have that, what would have that been if I would have done it? And I just don't want to think of that anymore. I don't want to think of that. What if, because like, there have been certain what if points in my life. Like when I was looking at moving from Philly, I was looking at, do I go to Pittsburgh? Or do I go to Boston? And I sometimes think like, what if I moved to Boston? What would that look like? It looked totally different. Or I had a friend in Nashville who was like, I really think you should come down here and play the circuit. You're good enough to do it, do it. And I think, what if I would have done that? But where I'm at right now, I'm insanely happy. I have, you know, beautiful children and a wife that understands me, which is great. And, uh, yeah. So it's, it's, it's all about that. What if game and just like taking those risks when necessary and not taking any risks that are just doing it for the sake of doing it. People that like taking risks. I don't like taking risks, but I want to be able to not have the regrets of what could that have been? Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense at all. Yeah. I th- that, that uh, I'm, I'm going to butcher this, but I think they say, cause you mentioned, like you started to say luck, but I think, don't they say luck is when preparation, preparation meets, meets opportunity mm-hmm. and that's, yeah, I definitely like agree with that for sure. And like, if I wouldn't have at least been starting to save some kind of seed money, some kind of like starting money there's no way I would be able to do my shop. So the fact that I had the little bit that I had that was already designated for that helped me get to where I was at. And, was and not even just financially, I think just your mindset yeah, too. Well, that's the same thing. Yeah. But like, you had to get to we had to that get, point. You had to get to the mindset of even being able to put the money back. Mm-hmm. You're like prepping yourself. It's like, okay, like I wanted to leave in the spring, summer, but right now it's the fall going into Christmas. It's like, this is scary, but it's like, look, if you don't do it, when are you going to do it? And so it is that, uh, that preparation meeting opportunity. And it's like, sometimes it's things falling the right way, but it, it's also how you, you look at it. And for me, I've never considered myself an optimist. I've never considered myself a pessimist. I've always considered myself very realistic and like kind of how I'm approaching something. And if I wouldn't have thought of it in that instance and taken it, it just wouldn't, it just wouldn't happen. Mm-hmm. You just have to be able to, to be like, okay, let's do it. The sky's not falling. Like it may feel that way, but let's at least go forward. Cause if I would have taken that regression or that step backward and be like, Oh, what was me? Like what is going on? And kind of, taking that hesitation that hesitation you know in a lot of instances hesitation can be life or death in this instance it's not but i just kind of look at that i never want to be the one that's like missing an opportunity or making a mistake because of hesitation it's like some people don't have that ability to to make a call in the moment and i think that's one thing that's like as far as like leadership is concerned like i've always appreciated at least about myself is like look I can make a call and I'm going to live with whatever that call is. If that's a great call, it's a great call. If it's a mistake, it's all my fault. And I will absolutely take, take that blame. Mm -hmm. But just being able to make a decision can be, you know, what separates someone from success and failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To have that, what is it? Um, Discernment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Jordan, I want to thank you for coming out. Thank you for having me. If you're in the Pittsburgh area, go to Clark Barber Co. Millvale. Millvale, yeah. ClarkBarberCo.com. Also check out his band Still. StillPGH.com. When I get around to actually putting descriptions in these videos, yeah. I'll link them. Be good. Dan, if we didn't play the clip, we can play it 
shortly, but Dan did an excellent video for us uh, that you should definitely check out. Maybe I'll put it like right. Is in the corner. Over there. Put it like right. Here. Okay. But it, that's an excellent video, and I'm really proud of the work on that. And then highbornbarber.com is the other one. Yeah. That's the one that's on Midnight Road. And I also want to thank Anthony Menzia for the intro and outro music. Thanks for watching.